Stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good evening and welcome along to Neil Oliver Live on GB News TV and on radio. Tonight our big discussion is around ivermectin, once a banned word when discussing Covid, now subject to small scale trials. We'll have a look at some of Her Majesty's favourite artwork now on display in Edinburgh. Plus we meet this week's Great Britain, Nicola Graham, who set up the charity Rubens Retreat in memory of her son. All of that and more coming up. But first, an update on the latest news. The US president says the war in Ukraine will not be resolved in days or months and that we need to steel ourselves for the long fight ahead. He delivered a speech in Warsaw after meeting Ukrainian refugees and the Polish president to discuss the humanitarian response. I visit your national stadium where thousands of Ukrainian refugees are now trying to answer the toughest questions a human can ask. My God, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? I saw tears in many of the mother's eyes as I embraced them. They're young children, they're young children, not sure whether to smile or cry. Well, the mayor of Kiev, uh, Vitaly Klitschko, and his brother Vladimir are warning the world is at risk if Russia targets Ukraine's nuclear plants. In an interview with GB News, the Klitschko brothers said they're grateful to Britain and the US for the support they've received, but it's just not enough. Putin's Russia is doing right now, destroying actually its own people, destroying life, destroying stability in the world, destroying nuclear power plants, that were on fire, and this is something that the world needs to pay attention to. Well, the mayor of Ukraine's Lviv says no one has been killed as more explosions hit the city. Infrastructure has been struck, but officials say residential buildings have not been damaged. Witnesses reported hearing three explosions in the outskirts, with black smoke seen rising from the northeastern side of the city. In other news, protests have been taking place at UK ports over the sacking of hundreds of P&O ferries staff as calls for the growth for the company's boss to quit. What do we want? What do we want it? Meanwhile, a P&O ferry has been held in Northern Ireland for being unfit to sail over issues with vessel documents and crew training. The operator replaced 800 seafarers with agency staff on cheaper salaries just days ago. Malala Yousafzai says the Taliban should not be diplomatically recognised as long as girls aren't allowed at school in Afghanistan. It's after the US special representative for the country said he's hopeful the decision to exclude girls will be reversed in the coming days. Nobel laureate Malala was herself shot by the Taliban for going to school in 2012. I believe in peace talks, I believe in dialogue, uh, but I also feel that at the same time, uh, you know, that they should not be recognized if they do not recognize the human rights of women and girls. Well, on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Neil. If you didn't laugh, you'd cry. So sometimes the only thing to do is laugh. These are difficult times, made more difficult by the manufactured fear and lies we're force-fed around the clock. There are issues that must be addressed with the utmost seriousness. But as I say, sometimes you just have to laugh. 
The way our leaders and their attendants are going about things, not just recently but for months and years now, reminds me of the behaviour of very young children, toddlers really. Sometimes a toddler will screw his eyes shut in the belief that since he can't see you, it must follow that you can't see him. If our leaders weren't applying this strategy in times where decisions make the difference between life and death, their antics would only be hilarious. Peekaboo presidents and prime ministers. They spent two years on lockdowns, spraying money around like white foam in a 90s nightclub, all the while lavishing multi-million pound contracts on friends and acquaintances, thinking we wouldn't notice all the new millionaires, generating unimaginable, unthinkable mountains of radioactive debt that will be glowing red hot for generations to come. We saw you. They ignored the alarm calls from all manner of reasonable people, from economists of the highest professional standing to just members of the public armed with no more than the experience of running their own households and bank accounts and piled the debt mountains higher and higher. Some of us told them it was a disaster waiting to happen and they told us we were cranks and conspiracy theorists who didn't understand how money and economies work. And what are they doing now? In the short term, they're attempting to launder the consequences of their lockdown idiocy through the tragedy in Ukraine, a shameful sleight of hand, the spiking cost of energy, inflation, the threat of shortages of food and all manner of necessities, apparently had nothing to do with financial incontinence in the past two years, nothing at all to do with shutting down economies around the developed world. All of it we're supposed to accept now is down to Putin's hellish invasion of Ukraine. Like that toddler screwing his eyes shut to make the approaching adult disappear, our leaders seem genuinely to think we can't see them, can't see what they're doing, all that they've done these years past. Either that, of course, or they just don't care that we can see them, because our seeing and knowing no longer matters, not when they think they've got us where they want us. If you didn't laugh, you might cry. Chancellor Rishi Sunak's wife is a shareholder in her billionaire father's IT and consultancy business, Infosys, with a personal stake worth hundreds of millions of pounds. Infosys continues to do business in Moscow. In the past two years alone, the Chancellor's wife has apparently been enriched by nearly 12 million pounds of dividends from Infosys. Mr Sunak has urged businesses to sever their ties to Russia, the better to strangle Mr Putin's ability to wage war. This advice apparently does not extend to people in Mr Sunak's own home. Exactly how stupid and or blind does Mr Sunak think we are? Mr Sunak is also among those of our leaders and senior politicians on both sides of the House of Commons who are genuinely, either genuinely don't know what a woman is, which is to say an adult human female, or else can't bring themselves to say as much when asked to define a woman. Here's a starter for ten. If you're a living human being, you are grown inside a woman. This inability or self-preserving refusal to stand up with and for women, a little over half the population of the country, would be laughable, hilarious, if it didn't have tragic consequences leading as it does to the erasure of women as the living, breathing realities that they are. For me, it's increasingly hard to avoid drawing the conclusion that our leaders and their little wizards are laughing at us. I say it's high time we pointed out that they are the joke. Remember when they said the COVID vaccines were 100% effective at stopping a person catching COVID, spreading COVID? Remember when they said those vaccines were absolutely safe for everyone from toddlers to centenarians? Remember when they said we had to wear masks when standing and walking inside a restaurant, but not when seated? Remember when they said we had to keep our distance from each other, even from loved ones? Now we can take refugees of war into our homes. This is a fine and noble act, of course it is. But why could we not invite our loved ones into our homes then, if it's safe to welcome strangers from thousands of miles away now? A person might be tempted to think it was a fiction all along, a nonsense circulated to make us behave. That question is anyway redundant because Covid no longer matters apparently, not as far as I can see. Covid is yesterday's cause of fear and therefore no longer required, not now that there's a war on. It seems safe to predict that once the war is over, the next thing to fear and for which sacrifices will have to be made upon the public altar will be along as promptly as an efficiently run bus. My money's on lockdown for the climate. The outriders for that stunt are already there, of course, with yet more calls to work from home rather than driving into work and leaving the car parked all day Sunday for the good of the planet. War in Ukraine is not the only cause of the mess we're in, but it will bite us all soon enough. I can tell you something to fear soon. 
and that may already be unavoidable, and that shortage of food. If not for us, then for millions of others. Russia and Ukraine grow 30% of the world's wheat and 20% of the world's corn. Developing countries already face shortages on account of sanctions. The developed world might have tried to compensate for the shortfall, grown more food elsewhere, except for the double whammy provided by the West's dependence on Russia as a key source of fertiliser. Western sanctions on Russia's exports of potash, ammonia and urea, along with other nutrients needed for fertile soil, threatens the growth of wheat, corn, rice and soy around the world. The price of fertiliser is spiking. Fewer fields may be planted, meaning smaller harvests. And that's on top of the dizzying hikes in the price of diesel. By the other end of the year, farmers may not even be able to afford the fuel necessary to bring in their crops. As the cost of commodities continues to rise in the months ahead, as hunger bites, there can only be more unrest and suffering to come. Of course, those comedians running our country insist we don't need carbon fuels anymore anyway, all that filthy, dirty gas and oil. And yet European countries have bought $19 billion worth of Russian oil and gas since the start of Putin's invasion on the 24th of February. We see you. Out of one side of their faces, they talk about the need for sanctions to throttle Mr Putin and his henchmen, the need for us all to make sacrifices. Out of the other side of their faces, they say, thank you kindly, Mr Putin, for keeping the lights on. The upshot of it all is that Mr Putin's war is paying for itself. He's even demanding the bills be paid in Russian rubles instead of American dollars. Other currencies are on the rise for dealing in crude oil so that the sun may be setting on the petrodollar after all this time. There's tragic comedy all over the place. Once you see it, as they say, you can't not see it. Klaus Schwab and his World Economic Forum talk about happy plebs owning nothing while the richest of the rich hoover up everything of value in the world. I think I know who's planning to be happiest. They plan to take away our money as well and replace it with food stamps, what they call central bank digital currency. Once that's in place, it's up to the banks what you spend, when you spend, what you spend on and where. If the bank has reason to think you shouldn't buy that bottle of wine or book that train ticket, then you won't be able to. Then there's the little things, like French President Emmanuel Macron. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky appeared on TV in a workmanlike green t-shirt and khakis and quick as a flash, Mr Macron had shed his bespoke suits and sent someone to buy some jeans and a hoodie from the boys section of his local haberdashery. Then he had a photographer follow him around at work all day looking butch and mean. Such antics, such pantomime designed to attract attention to self while real women and children are dying is nothing less than pitiful. Misinformation and manipulation of the truth has been going on for years now. In 2016, the Clinton campaign said Donald Trump had colluded with Russia in order to secure his election. The FBI duly investigated and found nothing. And yet the story of Mr Trump buddying up to the Russians persisted throughout his presidency, courtesy of the Democrat fawning mainstream media in the States. This week, Mr Trump announced he was taking legal action against the Clintons and their allies. Before the 2020 election, the New York Post broke the story about Hunter Biden's laptop the one left in a Delaware repair shop allegedly containing emails linking Biden Jr. to bungs of money from a Shanghai-based company linked to China. It's claimed there was mention of 10% of the profits for the big guy. Hunter was already in receipt of $50,000 a month from a Ukrainian energy company for doing, well, no one's quite sure what Hunter was doing. And what did the compliant US media do? They rubbished the report. Big Tech shut down the New York Post's Twitter account and banned anyone from sharing the story. More than 50 US security experts stood up to say it was all Russian disinformation. And guess what? The story about Hunter's laptop and those emails? Last week, the New York Times admitted the emails had been verified. The technocrats of Silicon Valley just didn't think American voters should know such things in the run-up to an election that their man, Joe Biden, simply had to win. They call such tactics the noble lie. They're lying, but it's for our own good. But as I say, once you see it, you can't not see it. The truth came out about how Trump had not colluded with the Russians. The truth came out about Hunter Biden's laptop. The truth came out about the Wuhan lab leak. The truth is coming out about vaccine safety and efficacy. What are they telling us this week that will be overtaken by the truth sooner or later? The truth seems to be moving faster and faster. As I say, if you didn't laugh at their audacity, at their seeming conviction that we can't see them, you'd have to cry. So laugh, I say.
but pay attention to the truth. There's more truth every day, and the truth, as they say, will set us free. Now, all of that is my opinion, of course, uh, and we like to hear from everyone on this show, so you can email and tell us what you think on gbviews at gbnews.uk, and you can tweet us as well at gbnews, and I'll read out comments uh, as we go along a little later in the show. My panel tonight uh, is the writer and politician Baroness Fox and the political and social commentator Richard Taylor. Welcome to you both. Hello. It's lovely to have you both again. You've been on this show before and I'm delighted to see you both back. Uh, Richard, I'll come to you first. What do you think? Are we being trolled, as they say, by our politicians? I think your monologue there, I mean, there's a lot to unpack, isn't it? I mean, clearly, you know, what we've seen over the last few years, and it's become more apparent to more and more people, certainly people that I would class as working class folks, you know, from the, the valleys of South Wales. Politicians and trusting politicians and institutions has been faded away for the simple fact that we haven't had the full truth. You know, we've been fed a whole kind of propaganda from, from media, from the, the big, you know, as you mentioned, big tech companies, pharma companies. You mentioned, the, you know, the vaccines. I know there's a lot of people that want to have a debate and a discussion around the, the you know, the, 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 how, if there was an adverse effects to the vaccine, if you like. But that kind of conversation got, got shut down. They don't want to talk about that. And, and the other issues you mentioned as well, we've been diverted on now to the, the war in Ukraine, which is, is serious, absolutely, and I think it's wrong. But I think, you know, mainstream media have not done themselves much justice over the last couple of years around the whole COVID things and lockdowns and reporting of deaths with and from COVID. And I, so it sounds like a broken record now, I know. But it's been like that but for so long. It matters. The questions people. are still yeah, not because, answered. Because people lose trust. You know, all we want from our politicians, to be honest, you mentioned Rishi Sunak there in your monologue as well, about his wife earning, you know, $12 million, whatever it is, from this Russian-owned company, but they're putting sanctions on other, you know, uh, tr tr uh, companies and businesses in, in Russia. I mean, again, whether that's right or wrong, I, I mean, it's not for me to draw a conclusion on it. From, but from most people, they would look at that and think, that shouldn't be happening because it's one rule for them and another rule for everybody else. And people lose trust in politicians when they, you know, when they do these things. And 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 we've seen it over the last two years. Claire, are we are we right to have lost trust? You threw an awful lot of things into that monologue that I think are not necessarily related. And I think that the problem is that you can end up with this idea that there's kind of like one thing after another that they are lying about. I mean, I don't see it like that, to be honest. I think that How there are... Well, I, I think that they have, if anything, been... in. Well, the political uh, classes have been incoherent in how they have dealt with a genuine pandemic that happened around the world and they didn't know what to do. They got themselves in a mess um, because they overreacted. They then got deployed the precautionary principle to such an extreme that they got onto, into a situation where they couldn't get off. And we can talk about that for a long time. And then, you know, you've talked about it on this show. It's just that then say you get to uh, w w the situation in Ukraine at the moment. I don't think, you know, and then they're lying about the war or now there's the war and that's something else we can fear and then it'll be cli climate change. I mean, actually, if anything, the war is an indication of the fact that a lot of things were not resolved before, and this is now a very serious situation where the redivision of the world is up for grabs. And I think it's... And so I, what I worry about is a loss of trust in politicians, a loss of trust in whether we can believe anyone, is leading to a kind of cynicism that means that everybody says nothing is true. And that just reminds me of a kind of postmodernist rejection of truth it becomes nihilistic. It means that if a politician says something, you immediately go, liar, liar. And I don't think that's helpful. And I think that, therefore, we have to be cooler in our assessment and not just throw everything in. I mean, I, you know, it's kind of like we had, you know... I mean, I can't tell you how bored I am by the Klaus Schwab thing. I mean, he's been over-flattered, in my view. I mean, he goes around claiming that every, he's put all these leaders in place. I mean, he hasn't, right? They all went on a training course, like me saying that anyone who's ever been to the Battle of Ideas, I'm responsible for everything they've done. Don't you, you can feel boast that... about it, mm. but it's... Yeah. I, what, I, what I worry about is, is that it makes it sound as though they've got a plan, and this is the plan, they lie to us, we're always victims, 
And I just don't... I, actually, if anything, what's happened is, is they've lost the capacity to be proper leaders and they don't believe in our capacity as a public, if, if you want, to, to deal with complex ideas and mm. treat everything in a black and white. I don't do, it seems to me that, there's a, that we've settled into a cycle where we get told something very dogmatically, very definitely, and that to, and to challenge it is, is not tolerated. And then it's as though enough time lapses. And when the, when the truth comes out, and it turns out that what people wanted to say and were prevented from saying is actually true, the powers that be don't seem to care that that, that, that truth has come out because by then the, the narrative has moved on to the next major event. It feels like there's a shelf life, a use by date. But, but, but it, I mean, I, sorry, Richard, what's yeah. going on? Just one, just one thing to clarify. I mean, I feel as though there's a danger as well that we end up with a kind of like, we can't ourselves think back to before COVID because I think it's slightly more complicated than that. I, I agree that that's the consequence because if you, like the, you, you use the example of the Hunter Biden tapes and it's absolutely atrocious, you know, the New York Post was treated like an absolute uh, pariah. pariah. And then, and everybody moved in and now they kind of casually mention it. So I understand, I understand where the cynicism comes from. The reason why I'm anxious is because I've watched people become completely disorientated and they, we are in danger of doing the, the mirror image, which is they say black, we say white because we don't believe anything anymore. And then you start thinking, what are they up to? What's happening? And I think that gives far too much credibility to the idea that this is something that they're in control of. So I think the issue for me is about accountability. You know, when politicians have said certain things, you know, over the last couple of years, and Claire mentioned going back before COVID, you know, there was a new a normal life that we all lived in once. And, you know, and I, for one, don't accept a new normal. I just want normal, you know, as I've always advocated for that. But I think it's the accountability aspect. So when politicians do make mistakes and they don't put their hands up and don't apologise, or there's no consequences for things that they've said that are, that are wrong. You've mentioned some, some issues there with Rishi, Rishi Sunak, but politicians are not perfect people. They're human beings, they? they make mistakes. And their private lives is really not for us to be interested in, in my opinion, you know, that's their private lives. But as politicians, when they make mistakes and they're not held to account, and even the whole thing about an inquiry in the next couple of years over, you know, the vaccine roller, for example, and the harms that it's done as well, which doesn't get talked about and the adverse effects which we don't want to talk about because we're afraid of it because it's a success but those are real issues to a lot of people and, mm. and people need answers to questions i was speaking to a lady just last week who lost her son he was 25 years of age and he committed suicide during lockdown you know and and i know claire's spoken out about this on numerous occasions and those kind of stories need to be heard and i think because they're not being heard, there, there are people within our communities and in society saying, well, hang on a minute, we're hearing of all the, this great vaccine rollout and what it's done and we've achieved this and, you know, we're giving you back your freedoms. Well, hang on a minute, you did a lot of damage to a lot of people. Yeah, I think that's... And that needs to be sorted out. And I don't... Whether it's a war in Ukraine or whatever's going on, that is quite sort of very serious. These are still issues for people and people want answers. And there are bereaved families, especially in Wales, where Mark Drakeford doesn't want to hold an independent Welsh inquiry into the lockdowns and everything else and the impact that it had on bereaved families. That needs to happen. And, and it needs to be done independently, not brushed under the carpet, because how many times have we seen things by politicians and mainstream media that just get brushed under the carpet and we move on to the next crisis? Well, I was, going to, I, I was, I was also going to draw attention to the fact that actually pre-COVID, people had been through the Brexit wars. And of course, a lot of people don't want to remember that actually... By, that by comparison somehow. Well, I mean, for a lot of people, that was a, a hugely important moment because they just assumed that after having voted to leave the European Union, that we'd leave the European Union. It never dawned on them that people would try and stop that, who ran society, and that there would be, in plain sight, as it were, discussions about... Um, the voters that were utterly contemptuous. So mm. people have lost faith. I can mm. see yeah. that. Um, what I'm saying is I don't want us to be disorientated. So I think we just need to be cooler. Yeah. Because even in relation to holding people to account, we also don't want to be so consumed with bitterness that we, you know, and you can see, you know, it's like when people sort of like, I want to get them. And what I think is, is that we must never forget what we've been through but I also don't want us to be in a situation where we can't return to normal because we're so preoccupied with this particular period.
And so it's balancing those things yeah. out, don't you think? Well, it is, but at the same time, you know, I, I constantly hearing voices in my head of the stories that I've been hearing over the last two years, Claire, which you've heard, and no, no doubt Neil has as well. And they, they kind of, they're like ghosts in my mind. I can still hear them being played yeah. all the time, you know, some of the horrendous stories of what people mm. went through, not being able to, you know, attend a funeral of a loved one, for example. Yeah. Those are still kind of, they're quite, I hear those voices and yeah. I think that the politicians were responsible for that. It was a political decision. But they, and, but, well, and, well, and, and all I'm think, saying is, I, is, what do we do? I mean, I'm not being funny yeah. because, you know, I, 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 when I've said before, we need to learn, for example, that we should never suspend civil liberties like this again. We should not close down the economy. There's going to be collateral damage. We shouldn't close down the schools. What m my concern is that we become overly dominated by, I mean, you know, vengeance in a <laughs> yeah. way. Because if you went I through every single to... story, but is that more on, is that mad. is that more on social media, though, Claire? Because I, I see a lot of that on social media. That anger, they're disorientated now. You know, and all of a sudden they've moved on from the Brexit, COVID, now to the war, and people, you know, I lose hope, all sense of, you know. I hoped after the experience of COVID, mm -hmm. when it seems to me that we had got to the point where uh, there was an understanding that all questions were legitimate and people's concerns ought not to be stamped on and just labelled as some kind of dangerous dissent. And I hope that we had learned from that. But we, then we got caught up in the war and instantly it was the same thing. that there were, there were questions that people wanted to ask. They weren't being treasonous and traitorous. They just wanted to, to uh, have a better understanding of what was going on. And in a repeat performance in relation to a different issue, any questions were just not to be, not to be dealt with at the moment. Well, when then? Because, like you say, when will we deal with the, the questions arising from COVID? Well, it looks as if we won't <coughs> possibly get to that because it, it's moved on. Yeah, I'm going to have yeah. to, we'll pick this up again. Yeah. I'll have to get to a break, after which we'll be discussing uh, both sides of the Ivermectin debate. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. The medicine ivermectin was discovered in 1975 and used first in animals as a defense against parasitic infection. It was passed as suitable for humans in 1987 and millions and millions of doses have been taken by people all over Africa and elsewhere for protection against many diseases, including river blindness. In 2015, the two scientists who discovered the drug were awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Ivermectin is on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. During the early stages of the COVID pandemic, 
Ivermectin was suggested by some doctors as a drug that could be used to treat some of the symptoms of the disease. It was cheap and easy to mass produce. To say this suggested repurposing of ivermectin was controversial is an understatement of note. And soon even mention of the drug in connection to the treatment of COVID was nothing short of career ending. It became the drug that must not be named. A report published in January this year about the results of a trial of ivermectin in a city in Brazil concluded that regular use of ivermectin as a prophylactic agent was associated with significantly reduced COVID-19 infection, hospitalisation and mortality rates. Joining me now to talk about ivermectin and why it became so dangerous even to talk about it are Dr Sam White and Sally Cutler, a Professor of Medical Microbiology at the University of East London. Uh, good evening both. Thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, Sam, if, if I could come to you first of all, why did anyone think to look at an anti-parasite drug as a possible treatment for a respiratory virus? I think for the non-medics among us, it's a, it's a hard uh, leap to make. Even for me in 2020, it was, you know, strange to be hearing about this drug, which is not widely available in the UK. It's a special order. But we go back to some of the literature from uh, 2012 even, and we can see that it was shown to have an effect against other viruses like uh, influenza, uh, Zika even. And so doctors like Dr. Corey, uh, Dr. Marek, Dr. Teslori started looking at how ivermectin might be used um, to treat COVID. And it turns out it's got an excellent safety profile. It's actually 4 billion doses that have been used throughout that time, uh, two or three deaths in that time. Uh, and that's due to a genetic abnormality in those people. So it's very, very safe, which is great. And actually, what does it do? One of the mechanisms of action is to block, is to block partly the spike protein, which is a protein, one of 27 or so proteins of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it stops it from binding and causing harm and damage and preventing serious illness. So this is something that could have been used back in 2020, uh, late, late 2020, we were pretty sure about it, to stop people becoming unwell, needing to go to hospital. And it was shown to have an 80% reduction in mortality. Now, what we had instead was a paper that was uh, commissioned by Liverpool University in collaboration with Unitaid, and it was discredited. This is a preprint paper, not peer reviewed, and it was discredited, not recommended for use. People went on to suffer and die needlessly for not being prescribed something like ivermectin. It's absolutely criminal. And what about this report then that's, 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 uh, that's come up uh, from, the, from the, the trial in Brazil? Does that add anything? Is it peer reviewed? Does it change our understanding, alter the mood now around ivermectin? Well, the mood should have been altered around it a long time ago. And we have to really ask who are the regulators working for? We've got over 80 studies on ivermectin in SARS-CoV-2. Many of them are the highest quality evidence, randomized controlled trials. And we actually got real life data in places like, like Brazil, as you mentioned. But there was actually a miracle that took place in the, in the province of Uttar Pradesh in India. That's, that has a population of around 220 million. They were suffering pretty badly uh, with COVID infection until they started using ivermectin. And I'd encourage anyone to go to the FLCCC website and look at the epidemiological graphs that they've, sh they've, they've shown there. And you see this massive steep drop in cases. Uh, and that was replicated in other countries like Peru. COVID makes a return in Peru when the president changes and suddenly ivermectin can't be used. If I can come to you, Professor Sally Cutler, you're listening to that. In the, in the context uh, of what Dr. White is saying, why was it deemed so important to dismiss all mention of ivermectin? To the point where it really was 
a, a drug that must not be named. What, why? People have looked at a number of different drugs that could potentially be repurposed and used to try and sort of have some benefit with our battle against COVID. But the data was not suitably robust. The original preprint paper that has been alluded to already, um, that was actually withdrawn because of the, there were serious ethical concerns over that particular study. And so the paper was retracted. And um, so we've had also a number of other studies that have also been mentioned by your other speaker. And basically, a lot of these other studies were open to bias. They, they weren't particularly well controlled. And so they've been criticized for not being sort of a good, robust study design. So since then, people have actually tried to look at, sorry, I've got company. Um, People have been looking at other studies and they've been doing what's known as meta-analysis when you look at lots of different studies on a particular topic and you pull all of that data together and you analyse that data. Um, and those studies have not been able to demonstrate any benefit from using ivermectin. And so this yes. is why major organizations like the WHO, um, the FDA in America, the European Medicines Agency, these have all decided that there is not enough evidence to recommend use of ivermectin. And you also have the, the potential to actually harm individuals because there are side effects from ivermectin. And the doses that seem to show some detrimental effect to the virus, they tend to be quite high, much higher than you would actually use therapeutically, safely in people. And so you're having to give much higher dosage and people are getting adverse reactions to that. They're, they're getting sort of neurological I mean, problems. You can believe what I'm hearing here. This yeah. is outright nonsense. Well, this has been no, used not safely. In America, in there's been a fivefold increase in, in people. Hang on, please let, let Dr. White respond to what you're saying. Here. <laughs> Dr. White, if you, go, if you go ahead, please, what, what, would you, what would you like to say in response to what uh, Professor Cutler was saying there? Dr. Tesla did a comprehensive meta-analysis and showed that this was highly effective in reducing mortality, reducing symptoms, and reducing admission to hospital. There was no need for people to suffer. We could have saved 80% of people. This is outright nonsense. And you and others who've um, legitimized the an experimental gene therapy in favor of safe, proven therapeutics, you have blood on your hands, frankly. Oh. Uh, Professor Cutler, I have to let you respond to that. I, I think a lot of, you can see where the, where the confusion comes for, for, uh, comes for members of the public like myself. You know, we were aware of this, this mysterious drug called ivermectin, and the, the conversations about it amongst medics were so... Well established. It's been used for years, but... It, but, but, but the conversations around it were so polarised. On the one hand, we were listening to people... On the one hand, we were listening to people who were saying it could have a beneficial effect therapeutically in the early stages of, of, the, of the illness, and others on, on your side of the debate were saying that it was downright dangerous and you know, not just would have no beneficial effect, but could be downright dangerous. So you can see why it's so difficult for people like me, just a reasonable person, to try and come down on a judgment about it. And I would raise, I would raise with you the, the, the point that the vaccines were expensive and that there were profits to be made from vaccines. Well, ivermectin was old enough that it was cheap. You know, it was a, it was a cheap and cheerful, readily available drug that might have been repurposed. And, and, and many people suspected that ivermectin was stamped upon to clear the to clear the decks for the vaccines, which would make money for the big pharmaceutical companies. How would you respond to that? Well, other drugs were looked at as well, like some of the anti-malarials were looked at. Um, and again, there was initial interest that those could have actually had a role in our battle against COVID, but they didn't show when they were robustly analysed and they looked at really large you mean robustly random analysed in that they, they, they used toxic doses of hydroxychloroquine. The usual they dose in, in 24 hours is 400 It's not going to help. 
Dr. Mike, go ahead. 400 milligrams and 2,400 was given to the trial precipitants. And then you say it's unsafe. It works highly effectively. All of these I drugs are provided for a political agenda I'm and for profit. It, it and as a result, people are suffering. And not against COVID because there's no track record or proven benefit of it showing a good, statistically different statistical advantage, yeah, for COVID. It's not been no, shown. No. To Dr. Pouchy wrote the, the paper on chloroquine <laughs> being no. effective in SARS no. viruses. No, Dr. Fauci himself, patient. your friend. That's the, that's the basic ethics of medicine not to this do harm to your patients i think this is I think the, 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 the talk, ethics, you two talking over each other ethics. sorry but you two talking over each other is not going to help the, the the general viewer you know come to, to any clearer an understanding of of ivermectin the, the benefits of it or not i, I think White. you need to get your information from a good thorough source social media is not always the best source for getting your information and a lot of the sort of promoting of ivermectin to use against covid has been propagated through social media um if it was actually going to show a really good benefit then the who the ema the fda all of these major organizations would have taken it on board. They've looked at the data. The data is not robust. It is not demonstrating that there's a really good benefit by using ivermectin against COVID. Do it's Dr. White, is, 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 any Dr. Research, is any of that research paper. going on now? Are, are, we, are we looking at, are we continuing to try and assess the, the efficacy or not of ivermectin? Is anything being done? Because the, the debate seems to be going on. Is the science is science being applied to try and find out now, one way or the other, whether ivermectin has anything to offer? There have been a number of trials, and the early trials were very, very small, okay. and they were open to bias, which is why the data was not suitably robust. Those, those studies have been done again and again in multiple countries, and we've actually had this meta-analysis where you actually look at all of these different studies, you pull all the data together and you reanalyze it. And those have failed to show conclusive benefit from using ivermectin for COVID. Sam, would you like to Those meta-analysis showed us that some of the researchers that conducted those trials deemed it unethical to continue with a control group. They deemed it unethical to see people continue to suffer because they weren't being given ivermectin and continue to experience symptoms and die. Okay, so they were stopped early. We don't need any more trials. Great if we've got them, but at the meantime, people should be demanding their rightful access to safe, effective medications. And we see the result every day of the politicization of medicine We've got even a cursory look for Sally on the yellow card scheme, the, the Eurovigilance or the VAERS data shows you just how dangerous these experimental gene therapies have proven. Why do I have to speak to people who were never at risk of COVID and now perhaps might not work again and have their lives damaged and changed because of these sorts of policies? It's absolutely criminal. I'll let you respond to that, Professor Cutler before we have to move the I think we have to look at the scientific data and the scientific data does not show a proven effect of ivermectin for COVID. And yet we're, your we're scientific data with look at the more science. people dying the of the vaccine. Important. I'm going to have to leave it there. It's, it's clearly a topic that divides opinion uh, to this day. I, I, for one, would just like to get to the point where uh, I, I felt a clearer understanding of, uh, of, of both sides of the argument as you're both putting them. But thank you very much, both of you, uh, Dr. White, Professor Cutler, for your contribution this evening. Thank you. I have to confess, I feel none the wiser. Uh, such a confused and confusing uh, conversation when, the, when, the, when it's so polarised between two extreme points of view. After the break, some of the Queen's favourite artwork is on display in Edinburgh. Do you share the same taste as the royals? Find out after the break.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. Spectacular paintings widely recognised as among the highlights of the Royal Collection have gone on display in Edinburgh. Masterpieces from Buckingham Palace at the Queen's Gallery brings together over 30 of the most treasured paintings that usually hang in one of the staterooms. Uh, GB News Scotland reporter Davy Donaldson has more. Incredible works of art going on display for the first time in Scotland. 33 of the Queen's private collection including landscapes, portraits and scenes of everyday life by some of the world's most famous painters, will go and show. Here's curator Isabella Manning. Some of the best paintings in the Royal Collection, but also in the history of art. There are four paintings by Rembrandt, his self-portrait you can see just behind me, paintings by Anthony van Dyck, Peter Paul Rubens, Artemisia Gentileschi, there's really something for everyone. Rembrandt's portrait of Agatha Bass from 1641 is also on display along with paintings by Rubens and Van Dyck. Rembrandt and Rubens clearly need no introduction, but there are captivating paintings by much lesser known artists. Here's curator Isabella Manning. I think two paintings to look out for are two genre scenes by Peter de Hoek. He was a contemporary of Vermeer, painting in Delft at the same time. And he paints these incredibly evocative scenes of everyday life. What's the standout ones for you as a, you're the curator here? What, you must have your favorite. Yeah, I do have a favorite. It's a landscape by Sir Peter Paul Rubens of Farm at Larkin, and it just feels like a complete celebration of the world around him. One of the most interesting and perhaps controversial paintings in the Queen's collection is Judith with the Head of Holofernes by Italian artist Cristofani Allori. It's an autobiographical work following Allori's failed love affair with Maria Dia Giovanni Bazzafiri. This is truly a great opportunity to see some of the most spectacular art in the world that is rarely seen. The exhibition at the Queen's Gallery starts now and runs to the end of September. David Donaldson, GB News. Claire, is it important, would you say, and, and worthwhile for us in, well, any times, but troubled times, to be reminded of, of some of the great works by geniuses over yes. the years? I didn't particularly enjoy the conversation about ivermectin, I have to say. And um, when I see those paintings, I think these are the important things. You know, there are times when you just kind of want to stand back. This is the most incredibly important set, of, you know, incredibly important set of paintings. People are lucky to have the opportunity to go and see them, stand and look at those great works of art. I mean, it is um, actually remarkable that they aren't on display more often. And one of the things that's slightly controversial is mm. the Royal Collection doesn't have many an outing. So what a wonderful opportunity. And I think those artists are 
speak to us timelessly. And that's one of the great things, a kind of universal conversation. You don't have to know anything about art to be able to stare at them and gain something beautiful and profound. Yeah. So yes, wonderful. I, I'm just so surprised that they've not taken them down or canceled <laughs> them like they've done with statues, you know, because they've got history, because paintings tell a story, don't they? Mm -hmm. it, might be, it might be fiction, but it might be factual, you know, historical context. And I'm surprised actually that the you're, walk lot haven't attacked them. You're right, you're right. I'm so, many, so many artists and authors in the present and in the past are being viewed through the, you know, very restrictive, a prism of 21st century exactly, morality. You can just imagine um, now, yeah. I'm worried that Rich's given a clue, uh, given, a, given an idea to some people, maybe they won't be watching GB News, but you know, you, if you're going to kind of go through and say, I'm not going to look at the art, I'm going to look at the morality of Van Dyke, I'm going to look at the morality of Rubens, you won't be able to see the art. And as that kind of Philistine approach has become very common now, and the irony is it's become mm. common in great scholarship centres like universities and museums where they're actually themselves, which is why it's so nice that this is happening, where they're kind of panicking and going, well, these are, after all, all dead white males, by the way, who were painting those paintings. You can't say that, can you? Colonialism, <laughs> undoubtedly. What it does... What, a time which we wouldn't have approved of. Yeah. Well, certainly what they do for me is that it's a glimpse into the, into the view through the eyes of someone long gone. Yeah. You know, that is how Rubens saw that woman. Well, that's how another of those artists saw that landscape. It, it's better than a photograph they might have taken in a way because they've put something of themselves into saying, this is what I see. But what I think is remarkable whenever I go and see, um, you know, art from, from hundreds of years ago, is that you actually see the development of, of the individual, the human, you know, I once went to see an art exhibition of crucifixes and it was kind of like, and, and depictions of Jesus and it kind of, like, mm. they got more human as, as, mm. as, as we, as it were. But what you realise was, is that you could see yourself in it too. And that's partly what it is. That's why they're talking to you. you you're seeing something of historical time, but you're also seeing how we have interpreted um, human intervention. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I was just thinking about the, you know, the, the, the head of the, 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 the holding of the head, yeah. And, and you kind of look at that. That tells you a story, the detail of the head, the horror, the passions behind it. And you can have mm. conversations about that forever, never mind the beauty of how it is painted. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. I have to go to another break, believe it or not. And after that one, uh, we'll be meeting this week's Great Britain, who set up a retreat in honour of her son, Ruben. See you shortly. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. 
And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. Every week on the show, we try to make space for stories that reaffirm faith in the human spirit. Ruben's Retreat is a charity dedicated to supporting bereaved families and those with children with life-limiting or terminal conditions. It was established in 2012 by Nicola Graham in memory of her son, Ruben, who died aged just 23 months. Nicola joins me now to talk about Ruben and the work of the charity created in his name. Hello. Thank you for Hi, nice to meet you, Neil. For me. Am I right in thinking that Ruben means behold the sun? Yeah, and he's called Ruben Michael after his dad, Michael. Tell me about Ruben and, and of course, therefore about Ruben's retreat. Um, so Ruben's ours and we had him for 23 amazing, glorious months here on earth. And um, Ruben became a little bit unwell in August 2012 and whilst on holiday within sort of like less than a week of diagnosis uh, we lost Reuben to um, an aggressive brain tumour. Um, he was a gorgeous little boy and because Mike and I worked in the travel industry Reuben had enjoyed many many holidays and many fun magical memory making moments and um, on the day that he died, I promised him that I would, that his life wouldn't be in vain and that I would create something in his memory. Um, there were lots of other families in hospital whilst we had that brief stay in hospital that didn't get that opportunity and don't get that chance to make memories with their children. And so I very much wanted to create a place that would make a difference for families, a place where they could come and make memories and have fun times together. We're looking at pictures there, obviously, of Ruben and what a beautiful wee boy. Um, how many families are you, are you able to help at one time? You know, what, what scale of, of operation have you been able to establish? So we launched in 2012. Um, I wanted to raise a million pounds in 23 months, which was Ruben's age when he passed away. And we raised that money within 23 months and we bought an old cottage hospital in Glossop, Derbyshire. So this is it. It's, it's quite a, it's quite a, a space to create. Kyle? So, you... Yes. Sorry. I, I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering, I mean, it, it's, it's all, it's things that are, I suppose, unthinkable in many ways, unless you're actually confronted with the reality of them. How, how do you talk to families who are dealing with so much, you know, what, what on earth can you say that, that makes a difference? Um, I think I think just having um, an ear to listen and a heart to hold them. Um, we're, we're working with around 450 people at the moment, um, a mixture of bereaved parents and parents with poorly children. Um, we bought that building and we've completed um, six phases of 10, it's a multi-million pound uh, project. And so we've created this last year, a hydro pool and a sensory room and a movie room. And sometimes it's just a place for families to be. Ruben's Retreat is very much a place where you can come and have access to everything that other families have access to. Um, you know, the full track and hoist and spacious rooms that are available to all families with com Complex of poorly children don't always get the opportunity to go out and be like other families and actually do things together like other families. You know, like some of our families say, you know, they look different and they eat differently. And here, everybody's exactly the same. And we just hold them the best way we know how with, you know, we've got a fantastic team. We're a team of nine, a really small but mighty team. And we offer peer support and counselling and fun days and parties and, you know, clowns and, you know, magical experiences for families to come and, and, and make memories. That's what, that's what it's all about. We've still got a long way to go. You're showing some footage there of our latest project. As I say, that's phase six of ten. And eventually we'll have five apartments here for families to come and holiday at Ruben's Retreat. That's a little way off because we've got quite a lot of money to raise between now and then. 
when I first heard about Ruben's retreat, I, I couldn't help but think that it would be a sad place b b by the very nature of, of the families and, and what they're going through. But uh, I'm, I'm guessing Ruben's retreat is much more than a, than a sad place. Much more than a sad place. It's really, really special. Um, our families say that the minute that they turn around the corner in the car and drive in, that they feel like they're receiving the biggest of hugs. You know, it's a really warm, inviting place. Um, it's got lots of history. You know, it was founded by an incredible um, cotton industrialist family that wanted to give back to the town, That you know, and the, the park was gifted to the town. And, and it, we were in a beautiful spot. And, you know, the building's over 130 years old, so it was actually founded on good. So, it, you know, it feels like the building was always meant to be, to be to give back and to be a good a good place really. So we feel really honoured and blessed to be able to purchase this place and, and continue to deliver beautiful work. Uh, our families are very very special and precious, and they deserve the moon on a stick. They really do. They're awesome. Uh, Nicola, I've got two guests with me here in in the studio, and I'd just like to you know they're they're listening to your uh, they're hanging on your every word here, Richard. These are. It, it, I say this every week, but I mean it from the bottom of my heart. It, it does something profound to me to make contact with someone like Nicola and to hear about Ruben, because yeah. it, it reminds me about the things that really matter on, on the planet, which which is to say families yeah, and I, children. It, yeah, with all the craziness going on in the world sometimes, you take a step back and you hear Nicola's story there and what she's done in honour of her son Ruben. And it's just, I, I find broken people become really, mm -hmm. you know, what they do with their lives through brokenness, they turn it a tragedy for many people into a beautiful story, you know, in honour of, you know, in Rubin in Nicola's case. And to do that, I'm watching the pictures there. I mean, mm. I, I fancy a weekend up there myself, Nicola, if that's all right. I'm, I'm myself. <laughs> You're very welcome. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> and I just want to say to you, well done to you, because you've turned something, you know, a tragedy in your life, in not just a story in itself, but you've done something physically. And that, that, that to me is just, I just applaud you. It's just amazing, absolutely amazing. It is special, isn't it, Claire, what, what Richard's saying, that it's, it, the recurrent theme, if there is one, of the Great Britons, and Nicola is absolutely a Great Britain, and I, I suspect Ruben was a Great Britain too, uh, is that you, you hear that someone was, was broken down by, by events, but so often they rise up out of it and transform their own hardship or tragedy into something beautiful. Yeah, what I'd say is that Ruben's mum's done good. And um, happy Mother's Day, Ruben's mum, because it's uh, very inspiring. And, um, you know, Ruben will be cheering away. Um, I think that um, you're absolutely right, Neil. W what we're talking about here is not being defeated. Mm -hmm. And actually not... It refers to something we were talking about earlier, Nicola, if you don't mind, but not being bitter, not being letting things eat away at you, but saying, I'm, I'm going to take something that's been negative, obviously mm -hmm. a tragedy, but I'm going to transcend that and then turn it into something that becomes a passion, positive. And I think that, you know, the families that come and stay with you must, you know, really owe you a great debt. And it's just what they will need. So fantastic. I'm, I'm in awe. Mm. Nicola, you, you hear that, and it's it, it, uh, the same sentiment is is shared by by everyone here. Uh, you know the very idea of, of Great Britain's. You know you you absolutely embody the thought uh, that that out of out of tragic events can come something that's so life altering for so many other people. You know that your that that Ruben's presence in other people's lives is so is so beneficial and it goes on year after year what a way to what a way to remember a special boy and and thank you so much for being with us this evening it's a lovely story so thank, thank you. you so much for the opportunity neil if anybody needs us we're on all social mediums they can find us and we wouldn't be who we are or where we are today without wonderful our army of compassionate love and hearts who, who help build this it's fantastic people are truly wonderful the great british public are awesome and amazing, and we're, we're part of a great, right. blessed journey. So thank you for the opportunity. It's lovely to hear from you. Well said to all of that, Nicola. You're just, you're just a gem. Thank you. I hope our paths cross some other time. Thank you for now. Hope so. You're watching Neil Oliver Live. I'm here until nine o'clock. This is GB News on TV, online, and on digital radio.
A little later, I'll be talking to a history professor about the plan to decolonise parts of London by changing place names associated with slavery. But first, let's get the latest news headlines from Miranda. Thank you. Good evening. The top stories from the GB newsroom. The US president has warned the war in Ukraine will not be resolved in days or months and that we need to steel ourselves for the long fight ahead. The US State Department is providing an extra $100 million in civilian security assistance to Ukraine. Joe Biden made the comments in a speech in Warsaw today after meeting Ukrainian refugees and the Polish president to discuss the humanitarian response. I visit your national stadium where thousands of Ukrainian refugees are now trying to answer the toughest questions a human can ask. My God, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? I saw tears in many of the mother's eyes as I embraced them. They're young children. They're young children. Not sure whether to smile or cry. Well, meanwhile, the mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, and his brother Vladimir say the world is at risk if Russia targets Ukraine's nuclear plants. In an interview with GB News, the Klitschko brothers said they're grateful to Britain and the U.S. for the support they've received, but it doesn't go far enough. We need much more weapons. We need much more help. We have to stop the Russians. A whole world surprise. How tough Ukrainian army defend our homeland. The mayor of Lviv says a fuel depot and defence facility have been hit during more explosions in the city. Officials say no one has been killed in the strikes. Witnesses reported hearing three explosions in the outskirts, with black smoke seen rising from the northeastern side of the city. In other news, protests have been taking place at U UK ports over the sacking of hundreds of P&O Ferries staff as calls grow for the company's boss to quit. What do we want? What do we want it? Meanwhile, a P&O ferry has been held in Northern Ireland for being unfit to sail over issues with vessel documents and crew training. The operator replaced 800 seafarers with agency staff on cheaper salaries just days ago. And Prince William has signalled British support for Caribbean islands seeking to become republics. A warning now, there are some flashing images in the pictures you're about to see. In a speech during the royal tour, the Duke of Cambridge suggested a future decision by the Bahamas, Jamaica and Belize to break away from the monarchy will be accepted by the UK. We support with pride and respect your decisions about your future. Relationships evolve, friendship endures. Well, on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Neil. These are hot-tempered times, uh, you may have noticed from the tenor of some of the conversations we've had in the past hour. Social media is more and more the public square where views are aired and shared. And for many, those virtual arenas are becoming too hot to handle. Censorship, cancelling, pylons, it can be daunting to venture into those domains and speak our minds. For many, it feels that freedom of speech itself is under siege and under attack. In the online world and in the real world, to voice an opinion can be to invite professional and personal ruin. But without the freedom to debate, to exchange views, to be heard, without fear of being shouted down in return, what will be the future of our society, of our civilization? Joining me now to consider these thoughts and others besides is the Reverend Gavin Ashenden, former honorary chaplain to the Queen uh, and more recently a Catholic layman. His own views have brought him his share of controversy. Good evening, Gavin, it's lovely to see you there. Neil, hello, thank you for inviting me on. 
No, no, it's a, it's a, my pleasure. Could you have predicted the, the febrile, the, the heated atmosphere in which we find ourselves at the moment? Did you see it coming? Uh, the, answer, the, the answer is yes. Um, I saw it coming about 2010, but that's partly because I was working in one of our more radical universities. And uh, so it was, if you like, at the cutting edge of this cultural change we're experiencing. And um, the, I think the thing that surprised me most of all was I had no idea how to describe it. I knew something was happening. Uh, I knew something was happening to freedom of speech. And if freedom of speech and freedom of of thought would be going, and it was clear that cancellation was taking place. Um, and it, it seemed to me this would be confined to the universities. What surprised me was the extent to which universities had proved to be a laboratory of social control, and the way in which um, already, <laughs> though I didn't know it, already a two or three generations had been trained in this new cultural relativism, and would soon be running companies. So it, it's almost as if now, I would say, there's a cutoff point. Everyone under 45 seems to have, who's been educated in, in tertiary education, uh, has been inducted into this new way of thinking. And the problem is that we don't seem to have the language to analyze it uh, in terms of what it is. And that's making it very difficult to, to discuss what's happening. Uh, so what, what is the solution? You've obviously given a deal of thought. Um... How, how do we find, and, and to some extent, I suppose, safeguard the necessary language th that would enable us to have the conversations that, that might point the way to the, to the road up and out of the morass in which we find ourselves? Well, that's, that's the $64,000 question. And the truth is, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm trying to find out. Um, and there are a few things, I, a few handholds I think I've got on the way. And the first is that, that generals... Uh, always try and fight the last war. And, and we're fighting the last war at the moment, and that's not good enough. Because what's happened is, in the last century, we had fascism and communism, both of which sought to exercise totalitarian control. And in the middle was, was liberalism. And to our huge surprise, liberalism has become totalitarian. But it, it shouldn't do, because by definition, that's what it doesn't do. But it has done. It's It's developed... Uh, it's developed ambitions for complete control. And so now we have three, if you like, three big world views, all of which have developed this ambition to control thought and behavior. So what worldview can we find that will, that will repulse it? And I think that's what we're trying to do at the moment. We're so surprised that liberalism has developed like this. We, we, we call it perhaps, you know, sometimes we say, well, it's been it's been taken over by cultural Marxism, and that would be true, but it doesn't really matter. The fact is that the, the, the one way of life that we invested our safety in has turned against us. So we're looking for a way of articulating a series of values that will protect us from this extraordinary steamroller of control. And, and for myself, I think it has to do something with Christianity because... The, the, the kind of oil under our feet is relativism. Uh, the moment you begin to accept relative ethical values, you begin to slip because there is no, there is no gripping point where you can say, I won't go any further with this. Um, so I think, the, I, I think that although, again, looking backwards, we've always thought that there's a, 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 a fight between secularism and Christianity, there shouldn't be any more. We, we have to stop that fight. And we have to say to secular humanitarians, and liberals, we have to make a common cause in finding a new language and a new value system because a steamroller that's coming at us uh, is at the moment unstoppable. How do you feel, you mentioned the, the church, how do you feel that the faith has acquitted of itself in recent years, you know, at least through oh, it, COVID and if not earlier? Yes, well, no, we've been doing very badly for a long time. I mean, I've, I've always been much happier with with Christianity than I have been with 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 Christians, um, I'm afraid I think the churches and, and those of us who've been in them have uh, we've done very poorly. Um, but that's partly because we've been confused for a while. The, the stuffing has been knocked out of this belief system that created what has, in fact, been the most wonderful culture. Um, Where do you? Oh, I think I think we've lost our connection to to the Reverend Gavin. Uh, Claire, you're listening there to, to the Reverend. Um, 
I, I sometimes wonder if, if there aren't uh, contributions that we do need from faith leaders, as well as, as, well as spokespeople for other ways of thinking. Uh, and I, 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 f I always find it illuminating to speak to someone like the Reverend there. Well, I'm, I certainly wouldn't. I certainly don't object to that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not holding my breath though, because I think that in fact, um, the Reverend was, or, or um, Gavin was actually making the point that you know, that the, the church and the faith leaders have got themselves into as much of a muddle mm -hmm. as anyone else. I mean, there's been a huge amount, of, if you want, of self-loathing. And one of the things that strikes me, there was a really profound insight there was, you know, we haven't quite got the language. I mean, we have got an illiberal liberalism um, it, liberalism has turned on itself i still i still retain cling on to the hope I, I still want to retain um liberalism i suppose I, I in terms of its association with civil liberties with free speech with the great enlightenment uh, thinkers and values but but i suppose that hangs over us here is is that this is where we get confused i believe in western values the people who run western societies don't tend to I mean, there, there, there we have a dilemma. Mm. The problem is, is that because we've, and then the danger we have, as it were, after lockdown and the things we were talking about earlier in Brexit is that people who now don't believe in Western leaders and Western politicians are in danger of abandoning Western values themselves. So, mm. is, so, so infuriated are they with the people who are supposed to represent mm. Western values not doing it, yeah. that they then forget to defend the values bit. Yeah. Well, Richard, you're I, nodding there. Do, yeah, you, do think you think that the, think the West is led by people who don't believe yeah. in the values of the West? We were talking about faith in institutions earlier, talking about politicians, and I think the church has let a lot of people down. Look, I, I was, uh, I'm a Christian myself. I'm not a great Christian, but I, I do attend a church and uh, I've got beliefs myself. But I think the church, what I've seen during the last two years, certainly, Claire, has become so woke uh, and it's irrelevant to a lot of people. They don't stand for the things that I believe they, the church should stand for. Just a personal example here, when we were you know, standing out against vaccine passports, I invited the Evangelical Church of Wales to come and join me. They never came, they never showed up. And I said, look, these are inequalities and injustices because they're segregated in certain parts of society. Surely as a believer, as a Christian, you'd stand for those values and they don't. And we've heard things from the Archbishop of Canterbury as well over the last couple of years as well, some things he's come out with. I think we've got Gavin right. back. <laughs> Are you, are, you, are you receiving me, Gavin? Hello. Good to have you back. I'm not sure what happened there. Can I ask, where do you go, as it were, in search of information that you trust? Uh, do you have sources that you, that you go to r routinely? Well, I go to on the internet. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've come to very much like Russell Brand because I think he's one of the few vo voices that actually tells us both sides. I and mean, he said, what we need to do is we need to hear both sides. I think Claire's point that, that, um, that the leader, the people who run liberalism no longer believe in it is absolutely critical. And if you put that with my point that liberalism has somehow developed an, in, uh, an incapacity to be liberal, we have to then find, I mean, you were asking me the big question of what do we do about it? And I'm afraid inevitably, and I, I wonder if my listeners can try and hear this differently, because looking backwards over the last 200 years, one would be tempted to hear it uh, as the imposition of a control system that people don't want to accept. That's how Christianity has conducted itself too often. But, but we need to try and lose that reflex, because at the moment, I don't see any other series of values I think I would say this whether I was a Christian or not, where the values of Christi which, which the values of Christianity give, and, and the values I'm talking about are the, that human beings are sacrosanct and that the conscience is sacrosanct. If, for example, we could, we could ally as a society around the, 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 the sanctity of human life, you know, try and stop killing people either before they're born or, or, as, or at the end of their life, uh, or by not taking care of them in the middle of their life, and if we could ensure that we so understood the value of humanity, we wanted to hear everybody's opinion, with those two things, we would be able to resist this in, in, inbuilt uh, antagonism liberalism has come. Now, if there's any other system that gives those two values, let's join with it. So Claire would say, well, yes, of course, liberalism does that. But now we're into circular argument. So liberalism isn't doing it. And I, the, that's one of the reasons why I would want to say um, 
in, a, in an entirely fresh way, if you can't find something as good as Christianity, you, you, you better consider at least becoming an ally. You know, in the same way that LGBT plus people talk about, well, you know, join us as an ally. I'd like to say to people, however badly the church has behaved and it has, however badly Christians have let you down and they have, I don't see a better system for resisting the toxicity of the controlling uh, energies that we're confronting. Do you do you feel that the do you feel that the pressure on on freedom of speech on on liberalism on Western values do you think it's do you feel that it's coordinated and deliberate? And if so, where is it coming from? I mean, if the if the leaders of the West don't have Western values, where are we? And where, where does this path lead? Uh, so again, we have to choose what kind of language we're going to use. And the, and the language of, sort of social hysteria, it feels like there's a psychosis going on. You know, there's, there's actually a corporate madness we've entered into where you can't have a politician define a woman for fear of losing their constituency, where, where biology and psychology, you know, biology and third wave feminism are at each other's throats. How on earth did that happen? Uh, so there's, at one level, there's a psychosis going on. At another level, the media seems to be deliberately keeping out one side of the information that we are due. Why would they do that? Is it, I mean, can it be an accident? And that takes us into conspiracy theory. Obviously, we try and keep away from conspiracy theories because they lure us too close to mental instability, and I don't like that. But so I'm struggling between asking myself if this is the most ghastly coincidence or whether or not there's some convergence of interest between power groups that aren't entirely visible to us that is adding a degree of weight and momentum to this, that, that, is, that is leaning on the bruised corporate psychosis that we're experiencing. Another question I'd like to ask, why did you decide to speak out in the way that you have you know, I've, I've looked into your, your background, you're a, you know, a man of the church, you know, you were with the, with the Church of England, with the Anglican faith, honorary chaplain to, to the Queen. What prompted you to, you know, to, to break ranks, I suppose, is what I want to say, and, and speak out in a way that has made you a controversial figure? I think probably the influence of Jesus, Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn. Uh, when, when I was... Growing up, I read a lot of Solzhenitsyn. It was it was in the early seventies. I used to smuggle Bibles to the into the Soviet Union. I got arrested by the KGB and given a rather hard time, both in Russia and Czechoslovakia. That gave me a sense, along with my contacts, of what Marxism would do to people if it was set free. Um, and at the same time, uh, I became a Christian because I couldn't find a better value system that 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 drew out the very best in humanity that I, 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 I wanted to believe in. Um, what, I'm, what I'm surprised at, you know, just, just at the moment when Fukuyama was saying in 1989, history is dead, liberalism is won, hooray, you can all relax and go shopping and do what you like. Just at that moment, this great, you know, the, the souffle of our democracy collapsed. Um, and, and so I, I had seen enough of Marxism to fear that we, that, 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 that we were being attacked by something that was very like Marxism 1.0. But it wasn't, it wasn't that. So what was it? I'm still trying to put a name to it. You know, Marxism 2.0, cultural Marxism perhaps. But it isn't that either. And so, uh, so part of the difficulty we have is I know what I believe in. I, 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 I believe in a God. I believe in absolute values. I believe human beings reflect God and therefore must always be protected and listened to, um, uh, but, but I don't know what I'm fighting in political, uh, in, well, in, in political and philosophical terms. It, it keeps on changing its shape. It changes its name. It, it moves under the surface. The bump changes to another bump. Um, and if I say cultural Marxism, everyone says, well, Wikipedia tells me you're a fascist because only fascists talk about cultural Marxism. I say, no, 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 I'm, I'm not one of those. Um, so, so every time we set out to uh, defend a place, we are ambushed. So you know, the poor feminists who are saying uh, women don't have penises are suddenly called transphobes. And because thought crime has got such a grip on our airwaves, 
everyone says, oh, well, you know, we, we believe in thought crime, don't we? So if this is a thought crime, they must be wrong. But actually, we shouldn't believe in thought crime. We need to go back and rewind some of the programming that's taken place. I'm afraid I think it starts with racism. You know, there is no definition for a race. So why have we turned antipathy to other human beings into a thought crime we call racism that we can never define? Um, you know, we absolutely, we need to love our neighbors as ourselves. But that would be a far better way to test our, in, our neighborly integrity than accusing people of a thought crime based on a criteria that we can never test. So it, it started a long way ago. And the moment we began to accept the validity of thought crime, you know, the slippery slope opened right up and we have homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, you know, all, all the kind of nonsensical yeah. crap that Freud prepared us for. Reverend Gavin Ashenden, you've, uh, what I've enjoyed most about listening to you this evening is the, your honesty in saying that you don't have an absolute plan of how to get us out of this, but that you simply want to continue to ask the questions in hopes, with the help of others, of, of one day coming together with something collegiate, that, that together we do find a, a way to something more, more pleasing and more satisfying than, than what we're confronted with at the moment. And I hope this is the first of many conversations that, that you and I will have together on this show. Thank you, Reverend Gavin Ashenden. Thank you. After the break, up to 65 burials of kings and queens have been discovered. I'll be joined by the professor behind the study. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. Now, much remains to be learned about the centuries that followed the departure of the Romans from their province of Britannia during the fifth century AD. Now, a new report has identified the graves of as many as 65 individuals that may have reigned as kings or queens in that distant and mysterious time, still referred to generally as the Dark Ages. It seems it was a Game of Thrones when Britain was a patchwork of little kingdoms ruled by Anglo-Saxons in the East and Indigenous Britons in the West. Joining me to consider the findings is the report's author, Professor Ken Dark from the Institute of Culture and Society at the University of Navarra in Spain. Uh, Professor Dark, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. What do you uh, want to know about the discovery? Oh, yeah. yeah. Are these, my first question is, are these graves newly discovered or is this a synthesis of, of archaeological finds that were already on, on record? 
this is a, a synthesis really of previously discovered graves which have been um, found over decades in a, the area across Western Britain uh, from Cornwall to the north of Wales. How do you know that they were the graves of royalty, kings and queens? What marks them out? Well, you can't absolutely, can't absolutely say um, that they certainly were, but an analysis of thousands and thousands of graves of this period leaves us with no other candidates for there being um, the graves of the kings and queens that we know existed in this period. So obviously they've got to be buried somewhere and uh, these may be the graves. How, uh, how extensive, is it possible to see how extensive these kingdoms were and how many of them were scattered you know, like, like patches on a patchwork quilt across the landscape? The kingdoms were um, varied in number as you go through the centuries from 400 to, let's say, 700, but approximately 12 of them seem to have existed in the west of Britain at any one time. But those 12 big kingdoms, about the size of English counties or um, sometimes several counties were broken down into what we call sub kingdoms, mini kingdoms, um, four, five, six in each of the bigger kingdoms, each with their own kings under um, an overking of the bigger kingdoms. So quite, quite tiny territories. When you think yes, of kingdoms, very, ter very small territories. Um, some larger than others. For example, the kingdom that existed in southwest England, the kingdom of Dumnonia, it gives its name to modern Devon, um, was approximately the size of Devon, Cornwall, and the west of Somerset today. So not uh, parish-sized kingdoms, not tiny principalities, but Nothing like the later medieval kingdoms of England or Scotland or Wales, for that matter. Do, do we have the names of any of these kings and queens? You know, we have the names I know, that, I know the, that putting the names to the graves the rulers, would be difficult. But can't relate those to individual graves, except in one instance where there is actually a tombstone for... Um, a king described on his tombstone as a king. That's a man called Catamanus, Cadvan in Welsh, or Cadvan in Welsh, who was um, a ruler in the northwest of Wales in the kingdom of Gwynedd in um, the early seventh century. I'm just, I'm nodding, I'm <laughs> nodding to uh, my, my guest on the couch here, Richard Taylor, a Welshman from North Wales. <laughs> He was nodding, Blair nodding, North Wales, yeah. nodding along, <laughs> nodding along at the news of uh, the only uh, the only king with a name being a, yeah, we, a fellow we, we, Welshman. Yeah. <laughs> um, was was Arthur the legendary Arthur in operation at this time in amongst these kingdoms? Well, it's possible that there was a um, a figure called Arthur at this time, but. If, if there was, we don't really know anything about him. It could be that the Arthurian legend just is a, a, a popular story of the time, a fictional character, a kind of Dark Age James Bond, um, but it could be that this was based on a real person. We just don't know. Is it, is it possible, if, if there ever was an Arthur, that, he was, uh, that he, he's a folk memory of the last of the Romans? I, I've well, read over the years that he may have, he may have represented the knightly, the knightly class of, of Romans who fought on horseback and, uh, and with a lance, and that, and that there may, his story may have come from a folk memory of the, of the Romans who, who did that their best. possible. The though, though the first attestations of the name Arthur occur in a group um, in the late 6th and very early 7th century. And those, that group um, consists entirely of Irish kings 
with British connections or British kings with Irish connections. So there seems to be an Irish um, element to the origins of the Arthurian legend, um, but whether that legend, as, as I said, was based on a, the sort of king who would be buried in one of these graves or, or just a, a folk story, a, a, a story bards told in the hall with warriors feasting, I don't know. When the, when the Romans withdrew, was it a time of chaos in old Britannia? Was it a time <laughs> of, of warfare in the rest? I, th I think that the idea of um, a chaotic 5th century after the Roman withdrawal is overplayed somewhat in um, many studies of, of this period, that there's a, a, as many um, situations in which stability was found, in which um, local people were not really affected by these circumstances, um, as there were that uh, uh, were characterised by upheaval and warfare and whatnot. Um, this kind of situation, um, what we see, is of collapse in some areas, warfare in others, but things going on much as usual in many of um, the west and north of British um, of the British peoples, um, and certainly that was the case in Ireland also. And so these kings and queens that we're talking about today would have largely ruled over um, stable and, um, to some extent, peaceful um, kingdoms and um, only occasionally have been involved in warfare with the Anglo-Saxons or um, with raiders from other parts of Britain and Ireland. I'm very glad to hear it. It's a, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, picture you paint, such a, a, a useful reminder uh, to, to think about this archipelago as having been lived in so very, very differently uh, by different peoples at different times, that it wasn't always anything like uh, the, our understanding of, of uh, mm -hmm. England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Uh, Professor uh, Ken Dark from the uh, University of Navarra, thank you very much for joining me this evening. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> it's fascinating stuff, isn't it? it, I, it what, I, what appeals to me about that time is the idea of, it's like the, it's small kingdoms, <laughs> well, whether or not you like a kingdom, but it's the idea of, of uh, uh, decisions being taken for smaller areas rather than these great centralised units that are, you know, out of touch with people. Yeah. You can imagine that everybody knew everybody else. Yes, I know, but it's also that they also knew their place. So let's be honest, you know, it might be fine if you were the kings and the queens, but if yeah. you were the serfs, not so good. And I mean, you know, you think about it, which was basically, it was a hierarchical mm. system in which you could never move from the chosen or the allotted place you had. So the stability was largely based on, you know, alleged stability was largely based on this notion that you if know, you don't obey, search. you get executed, you know. <laughs> you will always be, that's the way you are meant to be, that's where you'll, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, there was no, you know, there was no such thing as social mobility think, or democracy or yeah, yeah, yeah. anything. I think if they bring in the digital IDs and the central bank <laughs> digital currencies, we'll be right back. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll have to move on. Uh, all across London, uh, history is under threat of being erased. London Mayor Sadiq Khan has offered councils a share of a £1 million fund to, as he put it, decolonise their street names. Black Boy Lane in Haringey is to be renamed, uh, with households to be paid £300 compensation for the hassle associated with changing their addresses and all their documents. The entire district of Tulse Hill could be renamed on account of its having been named after Henry Tulse, who was connected to the slave trade. In all, no fewer than 45 streets and statues have been or may yet be re renamed or removed because of historic links to slavery. The whole project has been slammed as a vanity project by Conservative Party Chairman Oliver Dowden. Joining me to discuss the project and its implications is Jeremy Black, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Essex. Good evening, Professor. Exeter. For joining me. Sorry, Exeter. my mistake, my mistake. Don't worry. University of Exeter. Uh, is this the right thing to do, as Mr Khan puts it, to 
decolonise our towns and cities? No, it's rather stupid. And my last visit to London, it would have been nice if the tubes were running and he could have sorted that out. Um, I think it's actually a an aspect of a sort of hiding in the past and grievances that are created about the past rather than addressing the issues of the present. If um, Sadiq Khan is, is concerned, as he should be, about slavery, there will be real live slaves within five miles of County Hall at the moment, people that have been trafficked into the country for prostitution and other purposes. And it would be more interesting to see Sadiq Khan trying to deal with that. Or indeed, at the present moment, you can see Vladimir Putin trying to extend what you could argue is a form of slavery within Ukraine. But I'm afraid Sadiq Khan finds it easier to beat up on the past than he does to actually deal with issues in the present. Is is it being uh, is it being taken up enthusiastically across the capital? Are, are many councils you know, taking the opportunity to rename, remove statues? Is it is it well underway, or is there a, a hesitancy around it? Well, I think ever since um, you've had the um, demonstrations after the killing of George Floyd in the United States, you've had a certain amount of attempts to change names, remove statues, and so on. So some people clearly are committed to that policy. I suspect most people at the present moment in London, as elsewhere of the com in the country, are concerned primarily about current uh, inflation and are concerned about the plight of Ukraine. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the classic issue is whether Carringay should have a road called Black Boy Road. I don't know. You tell me. Um, incidentally, there is one in Exeter as well. So I, no doubt the town council could spend its time dealing instead of pollution, school problems, drugs and other issues in Exeter. No doubt it could spend its time on that if it's so, so minded. I take your point absolutely that time would probably be better spent as as a mayor in, in, in dealing with the present rather than the past. However, um, how, how might we go about making people better educated and better understanding the past? You know, my sense is that people, most people probably don't pay any attention to why their street is called whatever it's called and, th and that most mm. people walk past the street furniture of the statues, you know, without even looking up at them or, or reading the names. I'm obviously, my inclination is, is to have people be better informed about the past. And are, are there better ways of, of doing this and, and tackling and handling our very complicated and nuanced past? Uh, well, we do have history as a component in the national curriculum, and a certain amount of that is devoted to national history. Uh, not an easy subject to teach, but it is there. Um, and I think it's fair to say that partly thanks to individuals like yourself, um, there is actually a fair amount of, of history on the television, and there is no shortage of books on history in shops or in uh, or in libraries. I'm not sure that people are actually short of information. And you'd have to be pretty obtuse not to be aware that Britain played a major role in the slave trade. Um, and that this was something which, by the end, a lot of people thought, thought was shocking and shameful, and which at the present moment we think of quite rightly, we see it as shocking and shameful. I'm not sure actually anybody is unaware of that. So this idea that there is some kind of false narrative about Britain and its past and it's all being kept from us is, I think, actually rather ridiculous and also rather condescending to the public. People are well aware of things. They don't necessarily want to spend all their time talking about it. As you say, we have a complicated past. There are many other things to talk about, but there are many things to talk about about in the present. Mm. Uh, Professor Black, I'd like to uh, open this conversation uh, to, to my guests uh, here in the studio, uh, Richard Taylor and Claire Fox. Claire, listening to the professor there, is there anything meaningful in an action like this, or is it, as uh, Oliver Dowden has described it, a vanity project? I think it's a vanity. I think it's narcissism as well. I mean, it's a kind of, it's, it's, or it's trying to um, give oneself a false sense of a moral authority by robbing the past or leeching on these kind of events. I mean, Sadiq Khan has a lot 
of moral authority to kind of catch up on, as it were, and they and this can kind of make him some kind of hero. It's not just Sadiq Khan, but just just one thing is I I, I live in Haringey and I have been out of my home in Haringey for over two years because there was a fire in the block and Haringey Council have managed to not do the repairs. So 22 families are also not living in their flats. And I went to look at it today. And I mean, I, I mean, I just, I, I actually cried, you know, I mean, it just was like, there's just yeah. nothing has happened, right? And we're meant to, it was only, it was one fire in one flat. The reason I'm saying that is because Haringey have got plenty to do. Do you know what I mean? And the idea that they're compensating people with £350 to change the name of where they live, it's like sort of, <laughs> there are people who want to live in Haringey, they do live in Haringey, and you won't look after them or do the work. But there is one thing I wanted to ask the professor, which is I do think we have got a problem of historical amnesia, though, despite what you said, which I was very compelled by, about you can get access to things. Say, for example, when we've been talking about the the what's happened in Eastern Europe and you, I want to talk to people about the Cold War period and Yalta and the division of the world and people kind of are so stuck in the present that they don't know what I'm talking about. They can't understand why I'm going on about 1945, 1946 and, you know, mm. what are you talking about? So there is a problem in a way. It's just that this won't solve it. Mm. Yeah, no, I think I agree entirely with Claire. I think she's absolutely right there. I mean, in a way we do need to understand much more about the world that we are in, in a broader sense. Um, and as I've said, I'm not convinced that we endlessly need to talk about a set agenda of sometimes ones that are actually quite topics that are quite divisive in terms of our own, our own history. Um, I mean, I think you're from Scotland, uh, Dr. Oliver, and I think if you were to spend your time, if every single programme was to talk about the Lowlanders beating up on the Highlanders or the Highlanders beating up on the Lowlanders, that's not going to be brilliant as an account to get Scots to maybe think better about themselves. I mean, we could endlessly talk about Presbyterian or Royalist or Covenant uh, atrocities in the past. We could talk about the Jacobite Wars. We could present a really very unattractive and unappealing account of Scotland, whether within part of Britain or whether it eventually becomes independent. But actually, Scotland has a hell of a lot else to talk about in terms of enlightenment, industrialisation, an outgoing society looking at the world during the era of empire and subsequently. And it's not really very helpful to only dwell on the unpleasantness. Mm. Ditto if we're looking at other parts of the world. Uh, I think that there are complexities in most parts of the world, and it helps not to go for a monochrome account of goodies and baddies in, in, in the past if, as if that was the simple account. Claire has talked, has just spoken about Ukraine. As we know, the policy in Ukraine is very much uh, being set by President Putin and the circles round him, probably almost exclusively President Putin. It won't help if it's then used to say Russians automatically are bad people. And, you know, simplistic accounts about um, the role of slavery in the making of Brit the British Empire or British economy dramatically underplay, for example, the Scottish and English working class who went down coal mines and worked bloody hard in factories. And it's not really very helpful to talk about the descendants of those people and to tell them that they should be atoning for some kind of white privilege. I mean, quite frankly, it's, it's garbage and that's being polite. It's... It's an endlessly fascinating conversation and, and as you say, the past is so nuanced and requires careful handling. I have to move on. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Black, the University of Exeter, uh, for joining us this evening. Coming up, with smashed avocados growing in popularity, I'll ask an expert if the traditional English breakfast is under threat. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask, so why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. 
Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners, the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11pm, seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. Uh, author Somerset Maugham said, to eat well in England, you should have breakfast three times a day. Is there a creation uh, of English, indeed of British cuisine, as instantly understood around the world as the full English? By now, of course, there are Scottish, Welsh uh, and Irish variations on the theme, but all have more that unites than divides them, I would say. But where and when did the full English begin? Here to discuss the topic with us, um, and we were going to, I'll tell you now, we were going to fry some of the finest bangers known to humankind, but that's, <laughs> that's actually not going to happen at the moment. But I'm joined by Guy Boulle from the English Breakfast Society. Good evening, Guy. Hello. It's a, <laughs> Thank wait, you for what, having me. What happened? I, I was promised the, the, the same sausages that the Queen enjoys. What happened? Turns out I can't cook them. I can only eat them. It's, just, it's a thing of mine. I um, Tell me, tell us, when did the full English breakfast begin? How did it come about? Early 1300s, the gentry. So you're a historian, you know more about this, these people than I do, but they saw themselves as protectors of the countryside way of life, Anglo-Saxon culinary traditions, and they saw it as their duty to uphold, you know, the traditions of, of English cuisine. The thing that strikes me though about a full English breakfast is it's a lot of high value items on the plate. That's true. You know, all that meat for a start. I'm thinking that it it was not the it was not your typical uh, inhabitant of the of this archipelago that was coming anywhere near a full English breakfast. Well, I think years. if you set out to conquer the world, you need to breakfast properly, and a lot of meat's the way to do it, right? And another thing, why why is it that the, those items go so well together? Those those you know the eggs, the the ham. The, the bacon. The, yeah, but not black pudding, tomatoes. though. Black, black pudding should not be in a breakfast. I just don't understand the fascination with full Absolute English breakfast. Philistine. Of course it, you need black it's pudding. It's disgusting. I mean, I, I can't... I, I mean, surely... My, my dad loves it. I'm with you. I, I, my, my brother loves a, it. I'm not a fan of black I love black pudding, pudding with you. and white pudding. <laughs> so, OK, my Richard, loves so, it. since you raise the spectre, then, yeah. you raise the subject, what is right, so, the perfect f uh, full Welsh breakfast? For me, well... Fried eggs, not scrambled or poached. Poached is too posh, right, where I'm from, right? So you would just, you know, fry them. Two sausages, Welsh sausages as well. Sauce from a local independent farmer, not from a supermarket. And nice, big, thick, smoky bacon and beans and tomatoes and a piece of toast. That is a Welsh-English breakfast, if you want to call it that for me. Definitely. Clearly a gentleman. Yes, well, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I think the baked bean is sacrilege. Uh, yeah, I don't. I'm not on the baked bean question. Right. But uh, but what I was going to say was it's interesting that you were saying about the gentry because actually, if anything, you know, I I associate big Irish breakfast now for, from an Irish family with I mean, if anything, it's kind of partly the the peasant stock, and that was partly the way that you set up this item, which is you know sitting down and having a a full English or a full Irish or what have you. But that that was also because there was lots of potatoes. I mean, that were in in the Irish, and of course they were. Often farmers, so they <laughs> they would have had the, yeah. they would have had the animals at hand, and they had hens, and they could, and so on and so forth. 
So you weren't having to go out and buy food. It was literally on your dirt farm that you would actually have access to those mm. materials. So has it been being <coughs> consumed in the way that we understand it? Bacon, eggs, tomatoes, whatever, by the, you know, by a large part of the population for 700 years? I mean, has it had a sustained no, presence? No, what we have now is a reflection of what was. And what was was a celebration of British ways of making breakfast foods. All these wonderful ingredients in a feast before you that you could choose from. It was never plated with fixed ingredients. It was meant to be much more. A display of the skill of your kitchen in able to prepare these breakfast dishes, you know, the richness of your estate, the vegetables, the meat products that come from your land. It was always meant to be a way of showing off your good taste. Mm. Yeah. I was going to say, there's two things as well. I, I, I was served breakfast once with chips on it, round oh, potatoes. I mean, that, so sh wrong. that should not be for breakfast. And you, you can't have a breakfast without HP sauce. I might, I'm not advertising <laughs> HP sauce. It's got to be brown, though. I don't understand people who put red sauce on a breakfast. It has to be brown sauce, you know? I did, where did it come from, HP sauce? I don't know about that. Uh, uh, Parliament, surely. Well, yeah, it's, it's a normal thing. thing. Yeah, it's got yeah. the symbol on there, isn't it? But I, th but I think that it's, it's interesting, this, because what's now happened is, so I was saying about the peasants, obviously, uh, relatively recently, peasants, but, of course, now the kind of big fry-up rather than the English breakfast, is considered to be... What distinction are you making between well, the two? No, well, what I mean is, is that it's now got this slightly derogatory, you know, it's like... It's High in healthy. calories. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. know the type of people who That's have big fry-ups and caps. <laughs> That's what I'm saying is, yeah. got nothing to do with showing off your culinary skills from your great... <laughs> God, God's yeah. own right? people love food. If you yeah. think about the kind of condescension that's levelled at people who are going to go in and have a big fry-up, it's generally that they don't understand healthy eating and they're going to get a lecture off someone. That's an interesting mm -hmm. point, Guy. I, increasingly, when I read about things like keto diets and all the rest of it, we were told for a long time that animal products and animal fats were bad. Mm. You know, don't eat butter, don't cook in lard and all the rest of it. But it's <coughs> now been, it's come full circle, has it not? And in fact, there's a good case for saying that, that a breakfast heavy on animal products and cooked in <laughs> animal fat is actually a health benefit. Well, I don't think anyone would argue that cheap imported processed meat products fried is healthy, right? I mean, it's... Quality it's, ingredients. It's, Although it's, I, you know, if you take quality ingredients that are well made and you grill them, you don't fry them in oil, it can be a healthy alternative to pretty much anything else you're going to have for dinner these that's days. Not a fr that's not a proper fr but breakfast now. But fr make well, it's it's fried in, now. It's fried fried in, I, I, have a, I have got fried a Fried in lard, I think, is the healthy option now, rather than yeah. fried in these it's... mechanically, industrially produced yeah. oils. Yeah. You've got an amazing sausage. Why would you fry that? Yeah. I would fry it. I'd fry it. Well, I, I, you know, I would too, actually. Yeah. I've got a confession <laughs> to make, though, Neil. I'm I, I, not keeping it to the script I, I always have an English breakfast, <laughs> and I always have done. And I call it English, but obviously it's Welsh in my context, for the yeah. purpose of English. What makes it breakfast? Welsh? Just because the, this meat, sausages and bacon is sourced from a Welsh farmer. Right. I mean, that's it, isn't it? That's what makes it. It gives it There's no identity. special Welsh ingredients. Oh, no, definitely not. But you can't, uh, Claire mentioned not having baked beans. You've got to have baked beans on a breakfast, Claire. I mean, come on. Mm. I mean, you, you know, you, that, that is a breakfast. You can have baked beans. You know. No, I don't consider <laughs> that. <laughs> so much. I cannot believe that the most animated you've been all night is about It's the a breakfast. I know. It's breakfast. made me feel hungry. That's that. all from me on Neil <laughs> Oliver Live for this week. My thanks as always to my panel, Claire Fox and Richard Taylor, and to Guy. Thank you so much. Uh, bringing us that lovely information about the best breakfast the of them all. <laughs> to all my guests this evening, thank you. Next up, it's Mark Dolan tonight, and I will, God willing, see you next week. On Mark Dolan tonight, is Vladimir Putin close to losing the war in Ukraine? I'll put that to my Mark Meets guest, legendary SAS hero Phil Campion. In The Big Question, should smacking of children be banned? And in our news agenda, are second homes selfish? And has the halo slipped for Chancellor Rishi Sunak after a tough week? Plus another game show, alternative headlines and my all-star panel, including best-selling author Laura Dodsworth. And in my big opinion, it's time for a golden new era of grammar schools. See you at nine. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there.